Jason Fox, the Chief Digital Officer for Consumer Reports, the world's largest and most trusted nonprofit consumer organization. It's an honor to be part of the Town Hall Summit in this extraordinary time, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming innovation and entrepreneurship panel. Why? Because there's never been a more important time for entrepreneurs to stand up innovative businesses in areas of need like e-learning, telemedicine, supply chain management, and virus testing, to name just a few. As for existing entrepreneurs, this is a singular moment to double down on innovation or pivot. Customer needs are evolving quickly, so you have to be agile to keep pace even while we shelter in place. We're all in our homes more than ever, and we're casting a critical eye on surroundings we once took for granted. At Consumer Reports, we are seeing strong demand for smaller appliances like freezers and air purifiers, and anything home gym, home office, home entertainment, and home delivery service related. Basically, whatever can be brought to your doorstep or leverages the communications infrastructure. While some of these consumer shifts may be ephemeral, others are likely to be part of our new normal and inform your business strategy going forward. As you survey the consumer landscape, look for jobs to be done. That phrase coined by the late Clay Christensen posits that when we buy a product or service, we essentially hire it to help us do a job. If it does the job well, we tend to hire that product or service again. And if it does a crappy job, we fire it and look for new solutions. Put another way, the best products and services are meaningfully different, better than their competition. Finally, remember that ideas are cheap. Be that entrepreneur or innovator who turns ideas into reality. Now, I hope you'll join me in watching the panel, which includes my friend and former colleague, Sneha Shah from Refinitiv. Back to you, India. Thank you, Jason. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Before I start speaking and introduce myself, I'm India Gary Martin. I'd like to introduce my panel, um, some really great minds from around the world um, who have global experience. And I think we'll really be able to talk to innovation and entrepreneurship in a way um, that will be very thought provoking. And hopefully you go away with some strategies um, out of the back of this. But let me just start um, by introducing first Dr. Maeve Houston. Um, welcome, Dr. Maeve. Maeve is the um, head of UX research at Disney Streaming Services, so lots of interesting insight there. Um, a background in UX research for quite a long time, um, both at Capital One and um, Amazon Audible. Um, welcome, Maeve. Nice to have you. Then we have you. Colin Isles. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Colin Isles, um, who you'll see there with the wonderful green screen. Um, welcome, Colin. Nice to see you. Um, Colin has, has held a number of, of um, amazing um, roles over the course of his career, lots in the innovation space particularly, um, but is now the founder of Innovation Catalyst um, based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome, Colin. Um, and then we have Grace Mellis. Um, Grace is, is hailing from the wonderful sunny state of California. Um, hi, Grace. Um, Grace is the chair of HireCar, a NASDAQ listed company, an advisor for Techstars um, Tech Incubator. And I have a really interesting story about that, which we'll talk about later. Um, and Grace is based in Pasadena, as I mentioned. Welcome, Grace. And then we have Sneha Shaw, um, last but not least. So, so Sneha is the managing director of Refinitiv's business um, accelerator. Um, and previously the managing director for Africa for Reuters, Thomson Reuters. Um, welcome, Sneha. So, you know, this is this panel, when I, when I was thinking about and having conversations um, with the team around what innovation and entrepreneurship means in the current crisis, this group of people immediately came to mind for a variety of different reasons, which, which will be evidenced as we go through the course of this conversation. I'm really lucky to have you all and really appreciate you showing up um, particularly as you all are quite busy innovating and, and doing the things that you do and, and, and running businesses um, that require your, your brain trust at all moments in time. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk about um, the shape of this a little bit. And, and you know, cr 
crisis often drive innovation in ways that, that can't happen quickly in other circumstances, um, and thus entrepreneurship. Um, and so we'll talk about you know, the current environment for entrepreneurs, both established and aspiring, and the gaps that are emerging that weren't immediately um, as visible pre-crisis. Um, there was a really interesting quote that I'm going to read to you. I was, I was, this is an excerpt from the Harvard Business Review. Um, but there was a, a gentleman who was talking about his business and how it was impacted. He was from a bigger company. Um, and then all these kind of smaller new entrants came in. And I think we're going to see a lot of that happen in the current environment. Folks who are really agile and have the capability of jumping into spaces where there are gaps without the kind of the baggage of having huge corporate kind of um, behemoth, uh, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but who don't have to kind of drag corporations along, you know, so they can kind of jump in. And he says, you know, we're, we're seeing focused competitors in nearly every segment of our business. They're small, but they attack like piranhas. Um, the new entrants bring out products and services that their distributors loved. Um, their lenient return policies, and these are, the, these are the actual small companies that were in their sector, encourage customers to try their often, offerings. Their faster deliveries within tight time frames reduce distributors' warehousing costs and inventory levels. And they essentially kind of kill the business that, that this person was in. And so I, I want to kind of talk about um, the fact that obviously new entrants can be more agile and come to market more quickly with new products and respond to emerging trends, but they can lack the operational know-how to build sustainable frameworks for the for long term. So as we kind of go through this process, I also kind of want to touch on that with each of you who kind of are seeing some of that, but also experiencing what it is to have to innovate very quickly um, in your respective spaces. Um, so I'm going to start with Grace Mellon. Grace. Um, you started your career in, in big corporates and, and your last big role being, um, well, no, you, you actually were at Green Dot as CFO, but also CFO of, of Investor Services at JP Morgan for Europe. Um, but since then, you've been an investor and advisor for a number of tech and, and consumer startups. Given your proximity to the startup world, what are you seeing with regards to trends around innovation in the current crisis? And, and I think if you could talk about um, whether in that, smaller startups are seeing kind of like evaporating capital or whether people are putting their money with new and exciting developments, that would be great. Um, we'll, so can we start there? I don't know if we have a frozen grace. It looks like we might. So whilst we're dealing with that technical difficulty, Maeve, I'm gonna hop to you. Um, I'll, come, I'll come back to, I'll reframe that, that question for Grace um, as she becomes available, but Maeve, um, you work in the, in the UX space, kind of user space, user experience space, um, for those who aren't familiar with the term. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important that folks in this kind of environment are really intentional about, um, customer engagements and experience during the crisis, because people remember how you made them feel, whether it's positive or, or negative, um, as, as we kind of move through this. So wearing your UX hat, um, what consumer trends are emerging in this crisis and how might businesses respond in a way that captures the longer term value and loyalty of customers who are seeking, frankly, at the base, comfort and stability? Well, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, this pandemic has really changed the way that people relate to one another. Um, for example, a DJ on Instagram Live had an event in early March and over 200,000 people showed up. After that, this spawned multiple DJs doing the same thing and recording artists producing digital concerts. Families are staying connected using video, te video technology that used to be the domain of road warriors and corporations, um, but now families are using this to stay connected and bond with one another. The former is an example of tapping into the unmet needs of hundreds of thousands of people. And the former is people tapping into a resource that met an emergent need. And by need, I really mean job to be done. They're hiring people to do these for them. Um, but the reality is human needs really haven't changed all that much. We all crave connection and community and comfort and stability. And what has changed really are our circumstances. We're all sheltering in place now. And so we're being forced to find new and innovative ways of meeting that 
that need of connection and comfort and stability with other means other than just walking up to your family and giving them a hug. We have to find new ways to do that. So businesses that seek to understand these emotional needs, these jobs to be done during this time and the context of behavior and the environments that people are in, and then ideate innovative ways to meet those emotional needs um, will be super ahead of the curve in the long run. And so long after we emerge from this pandemic, the companies who keep their focus in a human-centered way, when they keep their focus on designing thoughtful products based on the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and the jobs to be done of consumers, well, those companies will be ahead in the long run and people will remain loyal to them. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's, it's a really, it's a useful, um, it's just useful to be able to frame that. Cause I think that, you know, one of the really interesting things around what business is being forced to do is be much more um, focused on the customer's experience and actually what people want in a different way. I think that, you know, always we develop products based upon what we think people want. Um, but it's really, it feels to me to be much more challenging to design for comfort and safety. I mean, those are kind of such intangibles and they mean mm -hmm. such different things to different people that being able to kind of, as a, as a business, develop for that in addition to whatever the kind of technical need is, seems mm -hmm. to be like, like where the rubber hits the road. And I think one of the more challenging things that we'll experience, are you seeing that, are you finding that alignment challenging to get when you're thinking about how you do your own work? Well, for, for, for me, when we're doing this kind of work, we're, we really are focused on uncovering jobs to be done. And those are really defined as these emotional and functional needs that people have. And so you uncover them in pretty much the same way. It's having an empathetic conversation with them to kind of understand those needs. And so for us, it's basically us doing what we've always done, which is have these conversations um, and probably have a lot more than we, we did in the past. But um, uncovering those emotional and functional needs. Emotional needs are super important because something might fit your functional need, but if it doesn't fit your emotional need, often people will, will kind of abandon it um, because they know something's missing until something else comes along that really fits that emotional need, but maybe isn't as functionally good, but they don't care. They'll stick with that because there's something really sticky about something that hits that emotional spot. Awesome. Perfect. Grace, do we have you? Yes, I think I'm finally back. Yay, we're glad to see you. So I'll, I'll go back and, and re-ask your question and just kind of prime you for it. So um, you you started your career in big corporate. Um, one of your big roles, one of your former roles being as the um, CFO of Investor Services at JP Morgan in Europe. I'm also CFO at Green Dot Corporation. Um, but since then, you've been an investor um, and an advisor for a number of tech companies and startups. And so kind of given your proximity to the startup world, um, what are you seeing with regards to trends around innovation in the current crisis? Um, and are you seeing businesses paralyzed by evaporating capital or is there kind of a, is there capital out there for the kind of new and exciting developments that, that are starting to occur? Well, I, I mean, it's a very pertinent question and I was actually on a couple of CEO calls yesterday just discussing fundraising. Um, you know, I think that you know, with Techstars, luckily they had a Techstars Anywhere program already where they had been experimenting for years with founders who couldn't make it to a local incubator. So they set up a methodology for people to actually be remote and work from Kentucky, Denver, you know, San Diego, wherever they are, and still be in a program. Um, I'm lucky to, enough to sort of mentor several different programs. So I was on the Anywhere program at the same time I was doing Techstars Music, which actually requires uh, it's an international program that brings everybody into LA from all around the world. So we had people in from Australia, from Estonia, UK, and when COVID hit, the two programs, you know, uh, very different reactions, right? We had to send everyone home. Um, and with that, it was very difficult because we then had to pivot that program, which where the labels are, are you know, our LPs, where Warner, where Sony, where Rekotoku from Japan, you know, where they come and they actually all gather in a theater. 
and uh, wait for demo days, you know, to, to be presented and then interact with the actual companies, right? So we've got these hardware, software companies, these ticketing companies, people who are at the intersection of tech and music, and all of a sudden they're being sent back around the world where they've been recruited for the past six months and they've got to do this remotely. Um, I think we were very lucky because of the Anywhere program, we were able to pivot um, uh, quite quickly and, and move people online. But, you know, I, I also saw the difference in terms of how the, the cohorts performed. The Anywhere program, it didn't make a difference. All of their mentoring and all of the stuff was online. They only had, you know, one in-person meeting in the beginning um, to kick off and then another in the middle and they missed out on their trip to, to New York. But from a mentorship program, they're used to seeing us on a Zoom call. Um, I think for the music program, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're pitching to artist management companies, you're pitching to people you don't know, and you don't have that personal connection. So, you know, that's part of, uh, you know, where people had to pivot very quickly um, and where, you know, programs that were already set up to, to do this did better um, and, and actually scaled better. Um, crazily enough, we had one company uh, that was trying to help farmers get stuff food to table. And uh, they were in Portland and their, you know, their projections blew out of the water because all of a sudden farmers no longer had their restaurateurs. They didn't have the distribution channels they had before and they needed a new way to get um, their goods out to market. Um, so, you know, there's a huge shift in, in which companies did well and which companies didn't do well as a result of, of you know, COVID and, and us being sheltering in place. Um, I think the capital issue is also a, a big one. You know, I think on March 17th, the, you know, the world saw, that, you know, the, the U.S. capital markets just drop out um, in a single biggest fall since the 1930s. And there was a, a paralysis at some point. Um, you know, I think the traders made money, but, you know, angel investors, seed capital, uh, venture capital companies were going to then help the companies they'd already invested in. So there wasn't a huge amount of excess capital for the new companies that were going out to raise. So if a class had finished last fall and they said, I'm going to go raise in March, all of their things that they had planned evaporated, right? And, and it's been very difficult for some of those companies uh, to raise. Um, one of the companies, Fine Sisterhood, is a social app uh, for women, by women. Um, and we had, you know, the CEO of Hello Sunshine had organized something here for everybody to come together for a fundraise. And it was for March 25th. You can imagine what happened to that, right? Um, all these assembled people over months and months of work just disappeared. Um, but, you know, the launch still happened and, and, you know, CEOs are still going on and they're trying to conserve capital. And I think in the previous um, panelists, they talked about risk mitigation, right? And that's really what we're talking about with a lot of the companies I work with now, which is, okay, so if you just finish your program and there is capital available and people actually still want to invest in your company, do you take it now or hope for a bigger round later? And, you know, if I look at where the stock market is now, um, you know, I think Stanley Druckenmiller just said yesterday, you know, it's, it's, it's too high, right? There's a, there's an over exuberance. I think there's a lot of hope in America, but everything's overvalued by a significant percentage. And uh, I was on a um, HBS call and, you know, with um, the Dean of, of Harvard Business School, who basically just said, we're not sure how we're going to start school. 30% of our mm -hmm. class is international. We may have to start everybody online. And for those mm -hmm. who feel safe, migrate them slowly onto campus or not, or let people defer. Um, and you know, the other prediction is that the S&P will probably drop by another 10 to 15% in September through October when the reality of our recovery becomes um, more, you know, I think clear. And so yeah. right now the market's recovered. So there may be capital. The angels might be, be feeling a little better about what they have. Um, you know, the PPP is out. And so some of those companies are turning back to actually giving credit lines um, that were shut down um, a few months ago. But I, I think that if you don't take the capital now and you're in the middle of a raise and, and you have companies that are willing to invest in you, uh, you might be looking down a long barrel um, in, you know, come fall, because if you thought you were going to raise then, I think the world's going to look very different in three to six months. Perfect. Thank you. That, that's, that's a tremendous kind of view of the world, because I think that's something we're experiencing all around. And, you know, I think the capital question, you know, I think it's really interesting because out of this crisis will come such opportunity. 
And there will be such an opportunity for folks to kind of dip into spaces, but not necessarily access to the capital to make it happen, right? So the question is, if we had unlimited capital, you know, there could be some amazing innovation and there still will. And I think maybe to some extent, you know, the cream will flow to the top and folks will fund the things that are absolutely, you know, kind of no brainers, but it's a real challenge around kind of identifying some of those things first. And then second, for the folks who have these wonderful ideas and, you know, and access to um, really great thought leadership around the how, but not necessarily cash to do the what, right? So that's going to be, I think, an interesting space. So Snail, I'll come on to you, um, actually, because you know I, I'd like to talk a little bit about types of businesses. And one of the things that's been, you know, kind of an enduring thread through your whole career, and as long as I've known you, is purpose. I mean, you've you've talked about that, and and how important it is for business to businesses, the intersection of kind of people, you know, technology and purpose. Um, as being the crux of, of how businesses really should operate. But in addition to your corporate career, you've done that and had, you know, you've been part of the World Economic Forum, United Nations, Harambe, just kind of um, focusing on demonstrating that purposeful business is not only good for staff and clients, but can also be tremendous drivers of, of revenue and economic growth. Um, you're now running a new, I think as of kind of a couple months, a few months ago, um, business accelerator at Refinitiv. Um, I think just kind of given where, given how quickly this crisis emerged post your launch, you know, this accelerator, um, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing and, and what opportunities do you see given what we've been talking about around comfort, stability, you know, purpose, um, around entrepreneurship in the current environment and, and what you look for? Cause I think one of the things that's coming out of that I'd like to come out of this panel is people to figure out how they identify the needs, like where the, how they might start thinking about the identification of those things. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the most interesting things about innovation, innovation is about solving problems and, and generally solving problems under constraints. So even the capital is just a constraint. It's not, you know, it's not an unsolvable problem. Uh, but I but I actually think this is there's no better time than now to actually think about innovating and being an entrepreneur because the amount of problems that we have in the world with our new normal uh, are tremendous and they're all problems that have not been solved before. And so if you're someone with ideas and with the ability to actually bring those ideas to the market, um, this is the time, right? Because if you think about, you know, it's everything from the, the obvious healthcare testing issues to actually what is our new world going to look like? And we're not going to go back to normal. And I think, you know, I, I keep hearing people say we're going to go back and we're not going back anywhere. We're going to go forward, right? Because, because from where we are, there is no going back. And so the best thing we could do is actually imagine what that forward is like and then actually design it. And so I think that's the opportunity for entrepreneurs. And, and that's where sort of purpose-driven business is really going to play a big trend because the best, most agile, innovative businesses will be those that solve real problems in our new future. And, and that's everything from very practical issues like, you know, we're all on Teams now and, and on Zoom and on all these conference calls and we've got this overwhelming amount of data and, and you know, we're in the data business. And uh, one of the things is today in the world, we're generating 40 zettabytes of data, which doesn't sound a lot, but actually 40 zettabytes is 40 trillion gigabytes of data is generated this year. And, and we're growing that to sort of 2025 is going to be 125 zettabytes. And so the number of sort of data points that we're all having to take in, the Zoom fatigue, the sort of, I guess it's it's the multitasking, all of that is taking a huge toll on human beings. And, and actually the technology has got an opportunity at this point to solve that by really being smarter. Mm -hmm. And so we work with a company in the Accelerator. Uh, we've partnered with a company called Module Q. Um, and Module Q, for example, brings in AI-driven insights into Microsoft Teams. So instead of you having to go search for information, it learns about what's important to you and then surfaces data and information just when you need it in your workflow. So it just takes away a huge amount of noise um, in the system. So, so that's a very practical example of things that you know, are really in the workplace. But of course, there's like lives at stake here. And, and you know, uh, Claire Christensen, who Jason talked about, he wrote this book, The Prosperity Paradox, uh, with the Harambeans around how innovation can really solve for big problems in the world. And we're seeing that, you know, with everything from sort of carbon and, and sort of the, the carbon footprint, and now companies all rethinking how are they actually going to go forward into this new normal. And actually, maybe they don't need those business trips, and maybe they don't need those offsites. And how do they reform their business in a way that's a lot more um, environmentally friendly to immediate things like there's a there's a, a Harambean that I mentor in South Africa 
an entrepreneur and um, his company is called Lula. And Lula had started off as a rideshare company before this crisis. And they've pivoted their entire business model to essential worker transport uh, safely in South Africa, which is a massive opportunity um, you know, for his business, but also a tremendous need in the market. Zipline, uh, which is an incredible service in Africa that's been doing drone delivery in Rwanda, has, has pivoted their business into medical supply drone delivery to, so that through this crisis, you can imagine in Africa, distribution is a massive issue, right? So it's not just actually finding people, testing them, but actually delivering them medical supplies. Um, and, and so Zipline's doing that. And I think those are the types of opportunities that I really see is there are so many problems. And so if you're an entrepreneur, this is the time to really step up and, and think about how do you solve those problems and how do you step into that new normal and design the future? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's brilliant. There are so, there are so many pearls there um, that, that, that I, we could pull out. I mean, I think the interesting thing that you said there that struck me as you were kind of talking through it is it's not just about um, entering the market space. It's also about if you're in it already, how you pivot and how you remain, how you kind of stay um, relevant through this period of rapid change. And then that, for me, seems a real challenging piece, right? Because, you know, I, I, it was so funny. I think maybe like sometime in March, I was thinking to myself, and I think I even might have tweeted it or writ written about it, um, that boy, you know, Uber and Co better change their business models really quickly because we're not going to be hopping. I'm not going to be getting in the back of an Uber for some time, being completely frank. What might they do? They should move to delivery because if you look at, you know, the, the, kind of exponential amount of delivery. Amazon has made a gazillion, bazillion more dollars than they already had because suddenly people are ordering everything online. There's a reticence to go out into public, into a whole bunch of things which are driving some of that. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, I'm gonna, we'll carry on this conversation after I kind of, I have a conversation with Colin, but I'd really like to, for us to come back and talk about that, that kind of pivot and, and how people might do it. I, I know that Grace, for you, um, there's one of your, one of the tech star, um, companies actually, um, distributed a product, which you sent to me, I, we were talking about it and what they've essentially done is they're taking subscriptions now for September. And I was like, I want this and I did it. And so there are people who are really smartly, you know, getting access to capital in ways that, you know, are non-traditional in the first instance. I mean, that's a model that exists, but, you know, during this crisis, it's a brilliant kind of pivot and ensuring that, you know, you can continue to do product development. Um, whilst you're in the midst of a crisis. So Colin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you. Um, Colin, I met in South Africa actually, um, when um, he was the CEO of Innovation, uh, sorry, Equinox um, Innovation and Leadership Center. And I'm gonna tell you that, um, that I still think about my conversations with Colin and watching him present. I mean, he comes foremost in my mind around innovation, particularly in so many ways, but um, Colin, you're quoted as saying that most organizations develop and execute strategies that are no longer appropriate to deal with the existential threats that disruptive technologies bring. Um, does that also apply to strategies to deal with threats beyond disruptive technologies and new entrants like, and, and I'm, con I'm considering the COVID-19 crisis a new entrance, a new entrant in this, in this conversation. Um, what would good planning look like and how might organizations arbitrage the potential outcomes from this crisis and turn them into frameworks for kind of sea level change, given your work and kind of leadership purpose, entrepreneurship, innovation, all of those things that, that the spaces that you, that you work in. Yeah. Thanks. India. what a, it's a great question. Um, to, to frame it, let's start um, with that initial statement. You know, most businesses, let's, we just go back to November last year. Most businesses are well behind the curve. Technology is just advancing at such a rapid exponential rate. A lot of the things that are happening now were forecastable. They were just expected to happen over perhaps a longer duration. So if you think about a range of technologies, I, I love the, um, the way that it's framed by Sally Mishmer when he says it's not just living one Gutenberg moment. We're living multiple Gutenberg, uh, Gutenberg moments at the same time. So that was obviously the, uh, the printing press and starting to go and, and share information globally. We've got multiple Gutenberg moments. It's not just AI. Obviously, it's all the forms of AI. We've got uh, VR that's coming along. We've got massive changes in the uh, cost capacity ratios of battery technology, which is obviously fantastic from everything from the phones that we use all the way to the cars. Um, and potentially over time in, in aircraft. 
We've got uh, photovoltaic just coming down exponentially in price, which is allowing distributed uh, systems to go and access tech uh, energy. And many people think that energy costs carrying on at this current rate are essentially going to become you know, free at some point. Um, similar ideas with 5G and internet access, where you can see the cost of access and the internet is is such an important backbone. It's like water now. It's like air. I mean, it really should be a human right because with that, with cloud technology, with massive compute power, which is coming down, it just opens up so many opportunities for anyone in the world to go and innovate, to solve problems, as, as um, Sneha put it. Um, and it doesn't matter. They can be sitting in New York. They can be sitting in London. They can be um, literally in Timbuktu. They can be anywhere in the world. And as long as they've got access uh, through computers now to massive compute, whether it's Amazon Web Services, you can do absolutely incredible things. That tsunami, that uh, massive set of Gutenberg moments is, I think, something that most incumbent organizations and their leadership teams have consistently been unable to stretch their imagination enough to think about both the opportunities that it brings and more importantly, the threats. And so it's no wonder that when you look back over, you know, let's say the last decade or so, you can ask the question, why didn't the Marriott team come up with the idea that was then instigated by Airbnb? Um, why did Kodak fail to go into digital? And you're just seeing an acceleration of that now because these things were going to occur anyway. And now COVID-19 with the lockdown that's occurred is starting to go and put pressure on, let's just use some examples, schools, online education, Khan Academy, um, Udemy, Coursera is just one example. There's been a huge opportunity for people to start educating online for years now. This could be that behavioral change moment where it's forced upon us, where who wants to go back to bricks and mortar education? Um, who wants to get on a long haul flight when it's perfectly adequate to go and do a Zoom call? Um, who wants... Mm -hmm. Um, to be going into a shop when you can use artificial intelligence with VR and augmented reality solutions over the coming years, and you can avoid having to go and queue and uh, you know spend that horrid time in a kind of a sales process in a in a shop in a shopping centre with parking. So, so the way I look upon it is it's going to be difficult to draw it, but most organisations I think look in the present too much. They almost imagine this normal distribution of risk which they manage, and they kind of get away with a little bit of. Um, scenario analysis based on their competitors and thinking a year or two ahead based on their historical data from the previous five years. Few organizations are sitting there and saying the world is changing. We've got to go and set um, a really clear innovation strategy in our organization to make sure we radically try to go and disrupt ourselves. Because if we don't, at the end of the day, someone else will be. Sure. This opportunity now, although COVID-19 is terrible, it should be an opportunity for leaders to go and use this to reinvent themselves, to re-explore what the future could be like. It's a trial run which has been squeezed into weeks as opposed to a number of years. And it gives the opportunity to really imagine what it's gonna be like. Um, what are you gonna do when autonomous cars come in? Well, that's meant to be four or five years away potentially. Maybe it's gonna become that bit quicker. It's time to go and change your business model to either support that innovation or to go um, and find new businesses which won't be disrupted when that innovation comes in. Um, from a government perspective, let's bring them in. How are they going to go and deal with mass redundancies because of automation? Uh, will there be a universal basic income? We can explore the uh, possibilities now, but and we're having to explore it in some countries by actually starting those types of experiments. So, so for me, this you know, and I think Sarah said it as well, is a massive opportunity for leaders to really get that wake up call and to think radically differently about how they should be investing in what previously were these kind of small probability tail risks, these black swan events, if you follow Nassim Talib, and actually have that realization they're far more frequent, they're happening all the time, and organizations are going to have to better prepare for a multitude of, of these black swan events because there's more coming. This is not the uh, first or the last. <laughs> this is certainly isn't the first or the last. I was, I was in the previous, um, the previous plenary session, which was leading in the new normal, uh, we were talking about, you know, the number of crises that we've each been through. And I was talking about the fact that, you know, I went through 9-11. I lived in Asia during 2003, during the SARS crisis. I then worked at Lehman Brothers in 2008. And then, you know, and now I'm dealing with this again. So like every kind of the, the bigger kind of um, economic events anyway, I've experienced in some shape or form. And, and you know, I think the thing that struck me, Colin, and, and I'll ask Mae this question actually, but the thing that struck me, Colin, that you said um, or the theme that emerged as you were kind of speaking for me is like, gosh, how do you connect 
to consumers remotely? Like, because you're talking about, you know, folks, you know, actually using technology, you know, VR and AI and a whole bunch of other things in terms of how they will likely, how we're moving in terms of our going to doing shopping and everything else. Like, how do you connect consumers in such a crowded space? Because suddenly the internet provides this huge place where folks who may not have had access before are suddenly, you know, in the space. And so, you know, may, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, about how you connect consumers in a really crowded market space when suddenly, you know, that's going to be the way. And, and, and we're so accustomed, you know, and I think that Colin brought, spoke it so well, you know, we're so accustomed to kind of doing things the way we always have and trying to apply the kind of old frameworks and, and models that we don't think about the opportunity that exists. So can you talk a little bit about, just a little bit about that? And I want to say before I, before I hand over to you, that Q&A will start in about 10 minutes or so, so people can start popping, um, their questions in the Q&A box. Please don't use the chat. Our executive producer is using our Q&A box. But Mae, um, what are your thoughts about how we might connect to consumers remotely and how we crack that nut? Um, so for most, I think, researchers um, in most of the uh, companies that I talk to, we're using some of the same uh, tools that we've been using for years. Um, and those are tools that uh, help us recruit and find people um, to talk to. And so we use Zoom. So often we don't travel to say, you know, certain parts of the country um, to do research studies. We'll just do those with Zoom. And we've been doing that for a long time in every role that I've had since 2005, I would say. We've been doing that kind of work. So that part isn't as different being in a technology space. I think what's harder is finding the right groups of people. So something else that Colin mentioned was that a lot of the the ways that people need to think about innovate, innovating in the future is to kind of look on the long tail. And um, for us in kind of innovating with a design thinking strategy, we call that looking to the edges because we say that's where the breakthroughs are. And so it's finding those people that's a little bit more difficult, not necessarily in the sense that we just can't find those people, but even identifying what those edge populations are so that we can make sure we kind of, we um, have coverage when we talk to people in a study. Um, that's really important. And so that's why we, we typically use an army of vendors. Um, and also uh, recruiting tools, online recruiting tools that, that we have at our disposal to help us find those people. Awesome, awesome. And, and, and Grace, you know, I think, can you just give a quick overview of what Techstars is and how it works? Because I think that will be really useful in the context of folks kind of thinking about opportunities and just some of the things that you might have seen, particularly um, around incubation at this stage of the game. Well, you know, there are a lot of incubators out there and a lot of accelerators um, that people can choose from. Techstars is one of the only global ones. So they have programs in South Africa and the UK, in the Middle East, in LA. And so they're probably the only one that's got a global reach uh, with MDs and programs and events over the past decade um, in every continent just about and uh, with MDs that are local as well as those that do remote investing. So. Um, here in LA, there are two uh, programs, Techstars LA and Techstars Music, for instance. Um, they bring in a class of 10 to 15 uh, startups every year, and there's a recruitment process. And then once the companies get come in, they take a percentage um, of the company for the initial investment of about 150K, and then they help them uh, with the surround of mentorship, um, they re the reach of mentors is in the thousands. Uh, each class typically has locally a reach of in the hundreds, 80 to 100 mentors at their availability. And you go through the process, you mentor match. Um, and so it's, it's a very um, resilient and deep process. And it also goes on forever. So they actually have founder conventions um, every year that bring people back together this year was in Italy, previously in Oakland. And so um, it, they always joke, Techstars is for life. Um, and the theme and the model um, of Techstars is give first. From a mentorship perspective, from a founder perspective, that once you're a founder, you've come through, you give first to the people coming, you know, coming along. As a mentor, you give first. Yes, we have the opportunity to invest in, but we, uh, those companies monetarily, but we actually invest ourselves in those companies first. Um, and, and, you know, 
you mentioned, uh, you know, both Audigo, which is a company that just went through Techstars Music, you know, they looked at an opportunity. We've got these cell phones now that have amazing video, but sound is terrible. And this guy is, he was a seven, you know, he was at te uh, Tesla for seven years as an engineer doing um, systems for the cars, but he was a musician. And so he's like, how are these sound systems so terrible? And so he's actually mm -hmm. done a 3D printed tiny mic that can actually do amazing audio quality sound without having to go into a, a sound studio. And so he's created the software behind to do the levers and to change the sound and then to sync that back to your video. So he's already demoed this with musicians where they're playing and then the quality of, of having that studio sound matched up um, and all of a sudden he has an opportunity, right? Uh, of distribution because people are home, there's more YouTubers, TikTok, whatever it is, um, but you need to have capital to actually go and manufacture. And you also have to have the manufacturing line and you know ab ability to ship. And so, you know, one of the other startups has is doing um, uh, organic chili made out of uh, in China. And she's like, my, my stuff's stuck. I, I can't actually get um, my stock because it's actually been produced, but nothing's being shipped or the docks aren't open. So, so there's a spoilage question if it's a food item, there's a timing question if it's a hard, you know, hardware item, you know, we, we have to think of supply chains in a very different way. Um, and, and you'd mentioned Uber. One of my other startups is uh, hire car where I chair and they had to do that pivot because they provide cars for people without cars to drive for Uber and Lyft. And with, you know, COVID all of a sudden we had to pivot to delivery, just as India had mentioned earlier. And, you know, we pivoted from almost, you know, 90% of our drivers driving for Uber and Lyft to, you know, a huge percentage of them now driving for, for delivery. But the great thing about delivery is they're making actually more money than they were driving for Uber and Lyft because with tips and people being grateful and them being on the front lines, they're actually able to get out there and actually make more trips and more money. Um, so we're partnering with the city of LA to get people who are out of work or MLB, we're talking to the Dodgers about people who are being furloughed, you know, the people who were selling for concession, the people who were cleaning, mm -hmm. all those people are out of work. How do we help them figure out how to onboard into the gig economy and do something different until right. they can get back into those sports um, arenas and, and have, you know, their day job back. Um, so, yeah, you know, bro. this is a huge opportunity for a lot of companies to um, take what they're doing, pivot, and then find new opportunities to grow, but it really will, sort the wheat from the chaff because the stuff that's a chaff just won't get invested in. Absolutely. That, that's, that is very true. I think Snail coming to you, um, speaking of that, I think it's really interesting to kind of consider. So we have that we've talked about the pivot quite a lot, but when you think about new entrants, particularly as you're kind of running an accelerator, um, what are some of the kinds of things? So, you know, obviously we can't give people the kind of blueprint for these are the needs that you can, that you can meet. These are, this is, the, these are the spaces because obviously it's evolving so quickly, you know, that, that there, everything's not going to stick, but some things will. But when you think about the kinds of businesses in, that you look for, or that you're going to be looking for, you know, going forward, because you're kind of pushing full fledged ahead, regardless of what's happening around, what are some of the criteria that you look for? Because I think for people who are thinking about how they evolve and grow businesses and how they even start businesses, kind of having an understanding of the kind of criteria that accelerators look for when they're thinking about evaluating viable options um, that they might, and I know part of it is sector driven for you, but still that it would be useful if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, for us, because we're in the, the sort of data business, we're really looking for people who've got data. And I think one of the really interesting things is we used to talk about financial services data as being quite fundamental data, right? Stock prices and currencies and things that, that you could imagine being in the financial world. But now with this crisis, what's really interesting is um, alternative data has become really a big part of people's financial models. So if you think about supply chain and, you know, Grace talked about how supply chain has become so different. How do you actually start to see where problems might be in your supply chain using alternative data? And, and one of the, the recent examples that I'm really interested in that I'm looking at is this company called Kinsa. And Kinsa has got smart thermometers and um, they built them so that they could actually track where there might be unexplained fevers and, and during um, flu season in, in the United States. And they've been you know, collecting this data for a number of years now. And so they were able to predict the New York uh, spike in fevers um, as being indicative that actually there was an outbreak happening in New York. 
And if you look now, almost 18 days to the day, they, they mirror the death rate in New York. And so, you know, by, by sort of being able to see that in, ahead of time, you could actually start thinking about, you know, what are the risks that you've got if you've got headquarters there, if you've got um, people going there, if you've got all of those things, how do you actually proactively prepare for that so that you're not contributing to the problem? And then how do you de-risk your business accordingly? So I think the alt data and, and sort of the different types of data models coming into traditional finance models is a massive trend. Um, and I think also this idea of responsible business, uh, where it's not just, a, you know, before we used to talk about responsible business being you make a lot of money and then you give it back through your CSR arm. Um, actually, it's now about are you a trusted business? Are you someone that people want to do business with, right? How you handle whether you applied for one of those small business loans or not, and whether you're entitled to it, how you handle your employees and whether you're furloughing people or not, and what you're doing around it, how you handle your environmental footprint going forward, how you handle your customers mm -hmm. and, and obligations that people have. All of those things are now going to make you either a responsible business or not. And so I think if you're an entrepreneur in, in the area of figuring out how to use data to drive more responsible business, whether it's things like ethics indexes or, or indices or, um, you know, employee engagement data or, um, you know, how, how do people feel about going back to work or what might be the new normal in terms of benefits um, for people, or, you know, sort of how people can feel like they're, they're part of a community in this new normal in a new workplace or how can, you know, leaders connect with their employees in this new normal. I think those are all going to be very interesting spaces um, to explore in data. But I think, you know, everything in our world now is data driven. So I think it is very much, I think as Colin, as Grace said, like find where the issue is and then find a way to kind of pivot what you already know about what you're passionate about towards that. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that, that is so clear and in and, and so many ways and so plain spoken because it's really hard to navigate this stuff. And, you know, it really is because it's such a big, it's such a big space when you think about what entrepreneurship looks like and the opportunities it presents um, and what innovation looks like and the opportunity that it presents in this kind of environment. So Colin, I'm going to come to you on two points, uh, two questions, uh, slightly different, but I, they could be related. Um, and I'm going to, Kind of start to tie in questions from um, Q and A. So if I'm looking off slightly as, uh, to the side, it's because I have a big monitor here, which which our producer is popping questions to me on. We'll probably have time for two or three. We're at twelve fifteen, and apologies, we were a little bit like we had we were changing over from the previous panel. So apologies for that. But um, we have a couple of questions I'd like to kind of shoot over, and I'd start with you, Colin. Um, one of them is about you talked about um, internet bandwidth. I mean, inter the internet and how important it is and how it should be a human right. Um, this question is about bandwidth and like the physical, I'm talking physical bandwidth of the internet and, um, and how, and what happens if we were to lose that or how it might be shored up because that, uh, you know, with, with all of the folks who are, who are online now, especially with lots of organizations shifting to work from home and a whole bunch of other things, what does that mean? And, and have you, do you have any experience or what are your thoughts around what that could mean, the challenges that might present. And, and the second question or? Yeah, sure. The second question, which was a, also a great one, came from Michelle Bishop at Harlem Needle Arts in, in New York. And she asks um, about any suggestions around how we get senior populations involved in the, in the kind of technology spaces, particularly. Um, she talks about being extremely concerned about reaching those who are refusing to get connected in some way. And actually it's gonna become more critical as this, as this evolves, especially as we move to more, more remote everything. Um, and so she asked that question, which I think is also a really interesting one. Sure, yeah. I mean, the first one is um, something I think for the, uh, the technologists in that school, all I can say on that is I've been surprised <laughs> how um, stable and sturdy that the you know access to the internet and um, access to data centers has been from my experience. I mean, we had a, uh, a major um, uh, transatlantic pipe that went down here from South Africa. Um, and yeah, you could feel it a little bit. You did notice that speeds uh, were dropping and some of the stability was, was lost, but you know, three or four weeks later, it's been fixed. So I've been incredibly impressed about how resilient it seems to have been so far. And I would suspect that a crisis like this is just going to give renewed interest for people that do play in that space to invest even more billions to make sure that the internet 
um, and all of the infrastructure that goes with it is just going to continue expanding over the, the next you know coming years. Um, it was a real shame I saw that uh, OneWeb um, has had to, to sort of pull out of the market because they ran out of funds. They obviously couldn't get SoftBank. I mean, if you've not heard of them, they were looking at really putting a satellite array out there so that we'd be able to access um, the internet from you know initially areas outside of towns, places where it's a bit harder to go and you know uh, lay lay cables down. But they were just one company. I mean, that's something, for example, which Elon Musk has been doing through SpaceX. It's something where there's rumors that Amazon are going to buy out their assets and continue it. And I think more are going to go into that. So so whether it be 5G, uh, cable companies, people that are in the satellite industry, expect more and more people to be participating in that space because obviously this is a really good heads up that you can see demand for data is just going to continue um, going through the roof. As you know, Snar said, we're at zettabytes. Well, we're on an exponential curve there again. I don't know what comes after zettabytes, but expect us to be hitting that, you know, in the coming years, especially when you see the more data intensive requirements coming on, whether it's, you know, 5G autonomous cars um, or virtual reality becomes something which we're using more regularly in, in various aspects of our life from meetings to brainstorms to schools and so on and so on. So I certainly hope I'm right. Um, and I hope there's no engineers out there that state that this is actually never going to be the case because it's going to be a really big problem if we do run out of capacity or if capacity goes down from time to time. It, we're, we're so dependent on it for basically the world to work. Um, in terms of the senior population, again, that's a, I think it's a, it's a really interesting one. I think um, if we talk to the senior population and put it in those terms, they'd be very cross with us. But it's certainly the case that we've got this expectation that the more senior, the more elderly you are, the harder it is to adapt. It's not actually my experience. I think that we we go into a lot of these conversations and just throw things at people and expect them to use it. You know, I've been working on technology and just using the laptops. Uh, actually, I'm going to use a better example. I use my son. He's eight. He's been playing on Fortnite for you know a year or so. I probably shouldn't say that. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I, but regardless, his ability, his speed, his ability to go and interact in that community in a way which I can't understand because I think I've touched it once or twice. Um, it, it's, a good, it's a good analogy in terms of then going to someone who's elderly who hasn't used Zoom before, or hasn't used an online course on Udacity before. It's foreign. And like anything, if you want people to adopt, you've got to go and show them in a way which they understand the benefits which um, are there for them if they can be willing and able to take the time to go and learn how to use the platform in the same way that if I want to go and uh, you know compete with my children, I'm going to have to put some time and effort to go and understand the keystrokes and the, and the actions, and in fact, what the whole game is about um, to go and understand that Fortnite arena. And so they're not going to adopt immediately overnight because no one does, not even people of our age or even the young guys that are coming through. You're going to have to be getting interested and excited about it. And if you can get passionate about it, I don't think age um, has any difference at all about the speed that people can actually adapt to these new technologies. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, I think, I think in a lot of ways, I, I will say my 73 year old mother is on Instagram. So that's a whole nother, I mean, it's amazing to me, but that's a, that's another story that we'll save for another, maybe after this, we'll talk about that one a little bit. Um, I know that we're running tight on time and, and it's been such a tremendous conversation and, and I've learned a lot when I think about the various themes that have emerged and I hope that, that our viewers have as well. Um, but I will ask you each one question. I'll ask you to keep it short and, and, and concrete. Um, but my question is, from this crisis, what would be your innovation dream? What would you love to see emerge um, on the other side of this? Because it will end at some point. We don't know what the, that length is. Um, but if you, with your innovator caps on, um, something emerged out of this, what would it be? I'll start with Grace. Oh, goodness. That's a tough question. Uh, there's so many amazing yeah. innovations happening right now. Um, I, I think that uh, my innovation dream is that with all this connectedness and all of um, the ability to do this virtually, you know, VR headsets and Oculus Rift, Disney streaming, you know, going live and, and, and blowing it out of the water, you know, I think um, that we still remember to actually invest in the technologies that bring us together physically too, um, after this is all over, um, that, that we don't forget that human element, however we do it. Um, awesome. but that's, you know, innovation dream. Excellent. Maeve? 
Uh, so a lot of people may not know this, but um, in my spare time, I like to teach uh, design thinking to young people. Um, and I call it um, trying to embed a little bit of innovation thinking into, you know, you know, the people who are our future. And so my innovation dream actually is to put innovation tools in the hands of way more young people and kids because they're so creative and, you know, the way that they look at problems is often so different than how we might look at it. We might have like whole planning discussions about a problem before we jump in and do something. And young kids are known to just leap in and start making something to try to solve. Um, but I think then those tools and recognizing that anybody and everybody can innovate um, would be my innovation dream. That's awesome. Snap. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I've been thinking about sort of what does our new normal look like and, and what's the opportunity for the stuff that I'm really passionate about around purpose. And, and I, I work a lot with an organization called One Young World, which is um, a collection of or collective of young leaders around the world who are very purpose driven. And I look at what they're doing through this crisis and they amaze me. And I think, wouldn't it be amazing if some of those people were actually the CEOs of the big companies that take us forward um, out of this crisis? And wouldn't this be amazing if this was the tipping point that allowed us to shift leadership, uh, leadership from the traditional leaders to the ones that really have purpose in their DNA um, and, and move us forward as a, as a you know, society, as business, as countries, as the world um, with that kind of purpose of you know, one world and, and social business? Um, as the sort of heart of it. So that's my dream. Wonderful. Colin, last but not least. Yeah, that's a lovely one from Snow. I guess this one expands it. I mean, my dream is that with innovation and the technologies that are now available, uh, we're, we're able to go and create a world where all the basic needs of people are you know, covered, that we see this world of abundance where whether it's access to food or shelter or medicine uh, so that you can maintain your health, that those costs, internet, you know, uh, access, those costs start to plummet or continue to plummet and eventually essentially become free. And then over time, we're able to see a world where, you know, like Snow said, that the purpose of life uh, pivots from waking up and try to earn money to survive to actually just working out how to enjoy life um, and doing the things that you really enjoy, you know, doing. And, and the, the income requirement side of things is vastly reduced in terms of its importance to do that. Wow. Well, my innovation dream is figuring out how I could teleport myself to South Africa again to visit you, Colin, and without having to get on an aircraft. <laughs> um, but no, but I will just say, you know, thank you all so much for, for these pearls and, and for being so candid with, with your thoughts around the future, um, what the opportunities are. And, and it's just, I mean, it's been, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have these kind of conversations in spaces where we're not necessarily bound by some of the things that we would have been bound by, you know, six weeks ago, even, or 10, or let's say eight weeks ago, you know, even the fact that we could all get our, our calendars to align to be able to be here. Um, so I want to say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Houston. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Sneha. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure um, having you. Um, thank you all to our participants who were so patiently waiting for us. I'm sure that it was absolutely worth the wait. Um, tomorrow, we will be returning for the Town Hall Summit Day 2 um, with being a founder during crisis at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, 3 p.m. GMT. Um, I have to do that in my head. That was very quick. And then um, we will at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, complete with our final plenary session, Purpose Driven Leadership, 11.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4.15 p.m. GMT. Thank you for joining us and um, thank you for coming. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.